Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. Today, we're chatting about the future of American orchestras with the great Simon Woods, President and CEO of the League of American Orchestras. So, Simon, I am so glad to be talking with you about this. We've been talking about the future, the present, the past of American orchestras for so many years. And just being able to sit here and share this with with our viewers is is really exciting to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Now, you know, over the years, we've talked when you were leading orchestras, and now you have this sort of dream job of of working with your over 600 members, uh, and you'll probably correct me with the exact uh, number, to advance the arts form. Could you talk a little bit about what the League does, its role in the ecosystem? And then we're going to go back a little bit in history and talk about your relations with the, with the League when you are actually leading orchestras. Sure. Well, you know, the League is like um, any national association in the sense that it's uh, uh, it does a lot of the work that all associations in every sector does. Um, it does uh, research, data, uh, professional development, of course, conferences and convening um, and uh, resources for the field. So everything from written resources to, you know, to digital resources. So there's a, I mean, we have a just tremendous depth uh, in, in of resources and things that we provide that for the field to support them. But in addition to that, there's a, there's another thing, which I think we, we think of as, as very important, which is we have a, um, a, a very important part of our mission statement, which says uh, lead change boldly. And so we see ourselves not only as a, as a membership support organization, which supports our more than 650 members, um, but but we see it as very important part of our work to kind of lead, lead change for the future, recognizing that, you know, we're in a field which is um, has, you know, it has significant challenges, albeit it's a very resilient field and it's a, it's a, it's a great field, but you know, like all the arts, it's a time of change and a time of challenge. And so we see this, this notion of, of thinking about the future and building the, the future and supporting the future as a very important part of, of the work that we do kind of alongside all of these very, very important resources, um, that we do, that we provide. And then, the other, the other side of it, which I'd mentioned, which of course is absolutely critical, is the uh, work we do in Washington D.C. Because um, the the league, as you know, we have a you know we have two people who work in Washington D.C. We have a two person office in D.C. And the the work that we've done there over decades, frankly, um, has uh, was transformational for orchestras during COVID. And many orchestras have told us they would not have made it through COVID without um, the, the 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 federal support, the federal funding support, um, all of which came uh, from you know men, much of which came because we were were kind of you know rooted in in the discussions um, in Washington, D.C. from, from you know, the, the, as soon as it became clear that the field, that the whole arts field was going to need help, uh, we were there. We were there at the table trying to advocate. Let's talk about that aspect. I think that's, sure. that's fascinating because sometimes people feel that there's a distinction between um, uh, advocating for an industry mm -hmm. when it is about building something physical, uh, mm -hmm. steel production or right. uh, technology or but but when it comes to the arts when it comes to entertainment when it comes to these uh, interactive things that that that's not really the affairs of government um how do you see the your work in washington affecting you as an industry and talk a little bit about the scale of that industry with 600 plus members and then every orchestra member every audience member um, every uh, every staff member who is part of these orchestras, the tourists who actually see the performances, yeah. you actually are an industry, right? We are an industry. And I mean, we, you know, if you think about the impact of orchestras, the uh, impact of orchestras in their communities is enormous. I mean, it works on many levels. It works on... Financial um, impact as well, right? I mean... Well, it's, it works on a kind of civic <laughs> impact. You know, if you think about the, 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 the impact of orchestras in, you know, every major city in this country relative to retail, hospitality, you know, hotels, um, particularly relevant to the whole issue of, um, you know, a kind of urban renewal. I mean, when I was at the Seattle Symphony, I remember 
um, we actually did a, an economic impact study which looked at the before and after of when Benaroy Hall, uh, the hall was opened in the late 1990s. And it's pretty pretty astonishing. I mean, it's it's hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, of civic impact, and that's that plays out in orchestras across the country. Um, and you know, orchestras have been a critical part of of helping um, urban areas come back after after COVID. So that story is a story we tell consistently in Washington D.C. But it's not the only story. You know, there's the other stories we tell are about. Um, you know, they're about them. They're much more. They're much more personal uh, impact. Their impact on young people, um, the inspiration of audiences, the impact of the arts on healthy communities, and a very big expanding area, of course, which is uh, the arts and health, arts and mental health, arts and physical health, um, arts as it relates to Alzheimer's patients. And you know, there's a whole there's a whole sort of emerging, I probably emerged a discipline around that work now. So when it comes to DC. When it comes, to, you know, work at Washington, talking to legislators who may not necessarily um, be deeply familiar with with orchestras, there are, there are many, many great stories to tell. And one of the things I'll say right now, because I think it's an incredibly important point, is a lot of the success that we've had in Washington comes from the fact that we are resolutely bipartisan as an organization. Um, we are uh, we, not having uh, political debates over whether uh, you know Beethoven or Stravinsky is the is the uh, uh, tradition holder, right? I mean, you're no. basically putting people together who might who don't know each other, right? Audience members are sitting next to each other. There, this is not a political issue; it's a communal issue. It's, oh, it's a community. It's a it's a community knowledge. issue, and also, you know, incredibly incredibly important to say. And that's why, uh, you, you know, I, I was just going to go on to say, like, the, the cross aisle support is vital because, you know, both Republican and Democrat legislators have uh, both sides of the aisle know very very well the importance of arts organizations within their communities, and so the arts has long enjoyed enjoyed that support. So, you know, telling telling these stories about about, about the the impact of the field that you know that's our work but i think it's important to say that it's not only about telling stories and looking for funding i mean, I mean of course during covid the the federal funding was critical but advocacy for us relates to a, a lot of other issues it relates to the issues of um, arts organizations access to visas for artists it relates to um uh, you know we have a very um you know active relationship with uh wildlife and fisheries as it relates to conservation of musical instruments which is a critical issue for all orchestras and musicians who tour uh, so that we're continuing to you know to advocate for um you, you know for, for sort of cross-border uh, freedoms as it relates to the transit of instruments while keeping an eye on uh, you know, ecological impact. So, you know, there are there are many many issues. I mean, right now we're involved in a huge issue, a uh, huge discussion in in Washington D.C. about around um, the kind of predatory secondary ticketing market market, which is you know recently. Ah which is really hurting orchestras and not only orchestras, by the way, theaters, opera companies, ballet companies. So we're, we're Private very, industry. I mean, it's, it's, you know, um, you know, a Taylor Swift, right? I mean, it's, it's basically everyone let's, let's unpack that, that issue uh, for a bit, because I think this is really important. The fact that you have these secondary markets means that money is moving in the economy, but not necessarily to benefit orchestras to, to uh, benefit the artists. Uh, not necessarily to benefit communities or venues. Instead, the, it's basically becoming a secondary market in which money is extracted sure. from audiences and they go to speculators, right? Exactly right. You said it very well. Yeah. And and there's and there's a you know you know it's not only that but it's also the whole issue there's uh, there's uh, aligned with that there are some issues about disclosures you know that of course in the um, you know, in the hotel market, this is an, an issue in the airline industry. This is the issue, you know, the kind of disclosure of taxes, taxes. Uh, and we have the same issue um, right now, which is to what extent orchestras are required um, to disclose the full costs at, at which point in the purchasing process and to what extent um, you know, the, the, of course, the, the the way that all arts organizations use dynamic pricing, just as airlines and hotels do. So there are some issues, you know, connected with that, which have to do with establishing good practice. And we want there to be good practice around that. We support good practice around that. 
Um, but we want it done in the right way. So, you know, all of these issues, you know, that come together, I mean, it's very, it's very, very important. And, and Heather Noonan, who is our vice president of advocacy, who's been with the league for almost 30 years, is, is one of the most experienced people working in, in government advocacy in the entire arts field. And we're very lucky to have her. And orchestras are very lucky to have Heather working for them in, in, in Washington. Now, I find this really interesting because when you were looking at this role and you and I were talking, I got the impression that if I compared the conversation then and now, today you have a much elevated sense of what the league does compared to previously when you were a member of the league in these various roles where you were leading orchestras. Um, how has that idea of, of the league's role and the sophistication that your staff must possess, how has that shifted from the time when you were when you were when you were a member, like so many of your other members? Because now sure. you're talking to your members, right? I mean, this show is talking to your 600 members, right? Or yeah. 600, what, what is it? 600 and 650 50, round number. 650 members. So if you were if you were looking at, at your earlier self in your earlier role and you would say, well, you know, you you, Simon, ought to understand what Simon is doing and Simon and his staff is doing today. <laughs> what, what would you say? Well, it's a good question, Mark. I mean, look, a, a couple of things. First of all, right now, I, I can honestly, like sincerely report that the, the league's value proposition has like has probably never been higher. I think since uh, since COVID, people are just there's an enormous amount of gratitude out there. Um, you know, our, our membership, at least of the the top um, hundred orchestras, um, I I won't quite say we've got a hundred percent of the top hundred orchestras, but we've probably got near it. So 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 we are <clears throat> we do enjoy you know very very strong support from the field. So so I think the the proposition is is understood. What I would say is the difference between when I was running an orchestra and looking at the league and. Now here I am at the league. The big difference is that I think that um, when you look across the field, different people in different parts of the uh, of the field only understand the part that relates to them. Very few people have the complete picture. So, for example, um, you know, people might know conductors might know about the conductors track and the artistic work we do for women composers and the um, you know the support we provide provide for you know conductors thinking about their roles in the future and the you know conducting showcase we've done every few years. Um, you know, marketing directors might mainly interface with us through all the work we do providing data about ticket trends and through the marketing constituency group. Some people may only know us because they've taken part in that in our um in our training programs in our professional development programs so you know everybody you know board members know us because of all the work we do around um supporting board members and the work they do and particularly board chairs because we have this very 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 um you know very important track which is board chair roundtables which happens a lot so everybody knows a bit of it right <laughs> I, when I got inside the organization, I simply could not believe the volume that was produced by this staff. We have 26 people um, and they're very dedicated and they're very, you know, it's a very, very good, strong, talented staff. And we've had a lot of stability the last year or so. And the volume is kind of astonishing. I mean, the amount of stuff that we put out on a on a on a weekly, monthly basis. Uh, the amount of thought that is going in for for programs happening in the future, um, and you know the new programs that we're launching. You know we launched a program for women leaders in the field called the Anne Parsons Leadership Program. We've got this very big new program called Inclusive Stages, which is designed to uh, support you know, increasing the pace of change as it relates to on stage diversity among the musician community. So the volume is is just immense, and I and I'm continually in in awe of of the people I work with and my colleagues. You know, and I say this to them regularly. I'm I'm kind of an in in awe of the, the the sheer volume we we produce. But you know, we have to, and so so that as far as you know, coming back to the proposition, you know, the thing we have to always remind everybody is that that. Um, 
just as when you go to a concert, you know, everybody who's ever been to a classical concert has heard this, this figure of, you know, the cost of the price of your ticket only, only covers 25% of, of, you know, the cost of putting on the concert. We have the same issue. So we constantly have to remind everybody that the, the dues that orchestra pay, orchestras pay really only account for about a third of the cost of running, running the business and supporting the field to the extent we do. So for us, philanthropy, the philanthropic support that we get, um, that's what enables us to to do great things and and put on new programs. So, you know, we have to, we have to constantly pe- remind people of that. You know, um, I I constantly reminded that we get the world that we pay for. Right? <laughs> we get the world that we actually invest in. And what you're basically saying is that we want to have a world that is full of music and interactions and audiences and live performances and great artists and diverse performers, we have to invest in that. And that's that's essentially what you're doing. You're converting ideas with the donations from your donors, with dues that, that are paid into reality. So yes. if you're going to focus on where the biggest change is likely to take place over the next several years to make this sector healthy, what would be the one or two things that you think are, are going to be are going to receive the most attention comparatively to to the past, where you have these persistent programs that have existed year after year after year, but now you're you're dealing with new challenges as an era every year. What is that essential challenge for this sector? Well, it's funny, it's it's fresh in my mind because I just came back from um, a trip visiting some orchestras and speaking to boards, which I do quite a lot. And of course, that is always the big question that that board members uh, would like to know: what are the big the big challenges? Um, and I think there are a few. Uh, one of them, of course, is the challenge of, of audiences. Right. So, so right now uh, we're in a very interesting position where um, you know audiences are definitely back after COVID. In some places, they're back and or orchestras have great attendance and they're very excited about where they are. Uh, in some other places, they are not back to the degree that that uh, is needed, and it's hard to kind of unpick exactly why that is. Um, if we had if we had a sort of magic insight and could know what what are the what are the the things that orchestras are doing to make orchestras to make audiences fully come back and give them great financial stability, and what are the things orchestras are doing that are that are not leading to that, then we'd be in a great place. But it, it's very difficult right now, looking across the country, to kind of discern what the pattern is but one of the things that i think we feel tremendously and 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 at the league we're constantly trying to advance this idea is that we really have to stop thinking about the audience and the community as two different things um and one of the things that i i constantly say is that in in certainly in large organizations a little bit less so in the smaller organizations but in the largest orchestras there is this kind of division between what we call community engagement on this side and what we call audience development on this side. And there's there's not enough integration of those two things because we know that in the future, we cannot be successful if we are just going selling tickets to the same slice of the population. And, um, you know, we know that the US by 2045 will be a, you know, majority minority country. There will be no single racial group that is a, is a majority. Um, and in many places, of course, that's a, that that has already arrived. And you know, I was just speaking to the board of a major urban area, which is one of those kind of sunbelt growth uh, areas with a lot of incoming population. You know, and I was observing to them like there is no future that is going to be successful for this organization without finding a way to engage those um, new audiences that are coming in who are a younger and b more diverse. Um, and you know, if you're going to do that, it's not going to be enough just to sell to them. You have to have some kind of sincere relationship with the community, which makes you think that you care about them. You're not just trying to extract ticket sales and, 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 you know, philanthropic dollars from them. So there needs to be a much more holistic approach to how orchestras think about growing, growing audiences and, and, and communities and and that's very of course incredibly easy for me to say as somebody who runs the 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 national association and much more difficult to do in reality because one of the things i think that orchestras are wrestling with on a local level is they know they have to do that work of the 20 30 year investing in the 20 30 year change but they also know that they've got 
you know, pressures on audience and cash flow this year. And that constant pull between knowing you have to uh, have to really much more strongly focus on, young, on, on younger people and diversity and all those issues that are pointing to the future and this kind of short-term pull to, to financial stability. That's, that's, that's something that is felt widely across our field. You know, and, and this is not new. I'm sure that Sophocles was thinking 2,500 years ago um, or, or more at this point, um, that you needed to make sure that that audience members were constantly being refreshed because once you present your play, you're not going to sell that same ticket to the same person more than once or maybe twice, but you need to constantly have new people in Shakespeare's time. The groundlings were the drivers of his success. The people who were coming in, standing in the uh, at the bottom uh, doing the cheap, uh, t- taking the quote cheap sh- seats and constantly having these new audiences, that was important to his own success. And it's why he is immortal because his plays could be enjoyed by everyone. And this is the same thing. This is what you're talking about. It's basically ensuring that the community and the audience is viewed as the same and cultivating that community and making sure that we have all sorts of segments finding a, a place for themselves within that that uh, performance that's yeah. what you're talking about, isn't to- it? To- totally true mark and and you know the thing is that that if once you start thinking about what the audience of the future is going to look like um you know there are profound implications for for how we how we show up right in front of our audiences i mean you know i always remind you know i often talk to to boards when i'm talking to boards i sometimes you know use the analogy of you know my own kids who are in their early 20s and i you know and i i think about the the difference in values and the difference in how they approach the world from how i was when when i was that age and i i you know i say to i say often like there is a there is a train coming down this track, which we're either going to get on or we're going to get run down by it, because because the, the, as we start to increasingly employ in our orchestras, Gen Z community, let alone millennials, they're already there, but the Gen Z community is you know increasingly now the community that we're hiring into positions on stage and into positions off stage and. In the future, they will be the audiences and the donors and the board members. And they have a completely different view of the world. They're a values-driven cohort, right? They're a cohort that, is, that, is, that has grown up with um, the, the notion of, of, of fairness. You know, I often say if millennials were the, were the um, digital natives, um, Gen Z is really the social justice natives. They they look at the world through the world of, of fairness, and they judge institutions by the way they approach, um, by their by their values and the way they think about that. So we ha- have to, if we want to be successful, we have to be responsive to that. Which is, and that has big implications for what who is on stage, how we present it, what what are the nature of the of the concerts, how how what is the front of house experience, you know, all of those things are going to going to have to shift from the kind of um, you know the experience that 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 you and I grew up with, you know, probably as teenagers going to concerts in our in in our cities. And your work as the head of the League of American Orchestras is so important in helping your members to think through those adjustments for their communities, uh, making sure that you're creating that that communication thread throughout the entire sector so that lessons learned in one market can be applied to uh, another market. Simon Woods, the president and CEO of League of American Orchestras, thank you so much for sharing this experience. Let's definitely do this again. There, there are so many different topics and subtopics that we can uh, take on over the next uh, uh, year. Let's let let's get together and and uh, and start to delve a little bit more deeply on some of these micro issues that are so important to your members. With pleasure, Mark. That'd be great. Always happy to talk.